You know how we had the, we, yesterday we were at where the board colonel died, you had the Michigan group. Uh -huh. That must have been interesting for you to have the two right there. Yeah. It's pretty neat you can see the tower at the way. Mm. I didn't bring the flag because I figured we were all here. <laughs> Let's come together. Please get into a compact group so that you all hear me. I don't want to get fallen forward. You're welcome. Bloody Lane. It was a beautiful day. Until the until the fall came in, but it looks like it's going to burn off. Mm -hmm. And it's going to turn into a day that was very similar to the weather conditions that existed on September 17, 1862. It was a very sunny day, a very mild day in the mid 70s. Hardly any clouds. Morning started out though, like the morning we experienced there at the Hampton Inn. It was a little misty. The Bloody Lane is one of these rare sites in the Civil War. You can only name four or five. I can think of only about four in which there was such prolonged, intense fighting. But these places, these names are permanently etched in our history. Places like the Bloody Angle of Spotsylvania, the Crater of Petersburg, and the Hornet's Nest of Shiloh. If war is hell, then this bloody lane was hell at its most sublime. Let me give you a little geography lesson before I go any further. That direction is east, generally. And there's a ridge called South Mountain, just three or four miles away. George Bergwin Anderson's brigade had fought on that ridge on Sunday, September the 14th. And three days later, they're here. That direction is north. And you can't see the Dunker Church from here. That is a significant land site or landmark for this, for this battlefield. That's that's the area that Will Bergwin will end up shortly before the action begins here. That's south. That's west and less than two miles. And Sharpsburg is, is just over the ridge there. Less than two miles is the Potomac River. We're in Maryland's Cumberland Valley. On the other side of the Potomac River, is the Shenandoah Valley. So this valley is an extension of the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. And you can see from our drive that it's a near perfect wedding of humanity and nature. This is a beautiful area. It hasn't changed very much. This battlefield is the best preserved battlefield from the Civil War our country. And there is a diligent effort to try to maintain it in the way it was when the battle occurred. And we are most fortunate to be here at the same time of year. That cornfield behind us was there 
It was up closer, almost up to the, to the split rail fence. And this field was more open. It was plowed or pasture. <clears throat> now, I'm going to take a little test to make sure you're paying attention. <laughs> because we're going to play, or we're going to have a pretend game in a little while. So without saying anything, I want you to think as if your life depended upon it. Who commanded the Confederate forces here at Antietam, or if you're from the South, Sharpsburg? Keep it to yourself. Get ready to raise your hand when I give you the signal. And then when everyone's raised their hand, just shout it out. I'll give you the cue. Who knows who commanded the Army of Northern Virginia here at Sharpsburg? No, raise your hand. <laughs> okay, this is not working. <laughs> this is not working. Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee. trick question. Okay, I got a trickier one. A trickier one? Uh oh. Who commanded the Army of of the Potomac, the Union Army from the north. Okay. George B. McClellan. He was supposed to work the other way around. Uh, George, it's all written right here. You weren't supposed to have those with fog. Okay. You're very fast learners. I'm, I'm, I'm really proud. But I'm, I'm sure the rest of the program will go just fine. <laughs> Only three roads came into Sharpsburg. How does that compare to Gettysburg? Ten. Ten or twelve. Well, it's different. Why would an army show up here if there are only three roads? They marched all the way from Gettysburg. This is chosen ground. Unlike Gettysburg, Lee chose this ground. He wanted to fight here. He challenged McClellan to attack him. His line was for three miles. This is the absolute center of that line. One and a half miles north, the Miller's Cornfield and Nicodemus Ridge. The Point and South. That's South. <laughs> one, and, one and a half miles south is the Warback Ridge and Snavely's Ford. Snavely, just as an aside, has some significance to my wife's family. That's her mother's maiden name. Now, as far as the time frame, we're one year and five months into the war. So we got another three and a half years to go. And this is Lee's first invasion of the North. Although he didn't call it an invasion, he called it a liberation of Maryland. Gettysburg would be nine and a half months down the road. <coughs> now, think about this past May, but you're in 1862. And the South is on the verge of losing the war. At least that's the way it looked to Abraham Lincoln George McClellan and with George McClellan's plan coming together. Union armies were on the advance everywhere. And his army was on the eastern approach to Richmond. Over 100,000 
men, the largest army in the Union Army, the Union, the, the whole United States. And there were three other armies in Virginia converging, two in the Shenandoah Valley, one in Fredericksburg ready to head south towards Richmond. If you'd asked an objective per person, they would have thought the war would be ended by this time, by the end of summer of the 1862. But a miracle occurred, a military miracle. There are two key dates where you can where you can see where that miracle turned around. May 8th, a little place even more obscure, more isolated, a place called McDowell, just west of Stanton, the Shenandoah Valley. That's where Stonewall Jackson defeated John C. Fremont. That was the first of a series of small, decisive victories. It went on for a month, and those victories of Jackson's in the Shenandoah Valley completely paralyzed the Union advance in Virginia. Another key date that you should remember, May 31st, Battle of Seven Pines. That has a lot of significance on what happened here. That was the day but George Burgwin Anderson won his promotion by leading a brigade and taking a, a Yankee position and winning his promotion to Brigadier General of the, re, of the regiments, the four North Carolina regiments that would fill this lane. A little more significant, the commander of the Southern Army was seriously wounded that day, Joseph E. Johnston. And the next day, Jefferson Davis appointed Robert E. Lee as general of the Army. And promptly, Lee named his army the Army of Northern Virginia because that's where he was going to take the war. We fast forward, the miracle has occurred. We're here on September 17th. Lee and his army have defeated and pushed McClellan back in Richmond in a battle called the Seven Days. And then he headed into central Virginia and defeated an army <coughs> under, under John Pope at Second Bull Run or Second Manassas. That happened at the very end of August. So in a time frame of just over two months, Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, the Army of Northern Virginia, had completely reversed the tide of the war. Two Union armies that were as large or larger, he had defeated one after the other, and he had sent them both into the defenses of Washington. Lee had complete initiative, and even without consulting Jefferson Davis, he had already decided this was the opportunity to try to win the war with one big battle north of the Potomac. Now he was shooting for Harrisburg, <coughs> Pennsylvania, the capital. <coughs> Sound familiar? That's where he was heading when he was in Pennsylvania uh, the following summer. Two things I want you to remember that are probably already apparent from, from the brochure. That this is the bloodiest single day in American history. Over 23,000 casualties within 12 hours. Nearly 5,000 dead, although that's not, that's only an estimate. The official numbers are just under 4,000. But there were 2,000 missing, and many of those did not most of them were probably killed and buried on the battlefield by the farmers and their families who lived here, much in the same way as what happened in Gettysburg. So we are on another cemetery. The other thing that we're probably most aware of, this is the battle that the North won that allowed Lincoln to go ahead and issue his Emancipation Proclamation. 
Five days later, after following this battle, he made his preliminary announcement of the issuance of the, of the Emancipation Proclamation. That changed the nature of the war. At the beginning of the war, he only had one aim that unified the North. Union. Reunite the two sections. If the war had been won on schedule, the end of the summer, the way McClellan had suggested, and the kind of war that both McClellan and, and Lincoln would have liked to have conducted, the slaves would have remained slaves. <laughs> But as the tide turned against the North, Lincoln felt he had to take new war measures to improve the chances of defeating the South. And that meant, as a military expediency, bring only the slaves in the states that were in open, active rebellion. Four other slave states They could keep them. He had to keep that political alliance, a coalition of conservative Democrats who ran the Army of the Potomac and his radical Republicans who were every day calling on Lincoln to abolish slavery. So the, the first step towards the total emancipa emancipation of African -American, <coughs> Americans and their long march, their long march to full citizenship, this was their first victory. Now let's get, let's get back to George Bergwin Anderson. You remember a moving letter among many that Elizabeth read yesterday one of them from the North Anna, down in Virginia, when he wrote that he had a new commander, a guy named Daniel Harvey Lee, excuse me, Daniel Harvey Hill. Hill. <laughs> um, and he mentioned in that letter that he had real concerns about General Hill. But he also said he felt that Hill liked him. Well, his concerns were no one got along with D.H. Hill. If he worked in your office, if he was your manager in your workplace, if you were a member of an organization that he was a member, you would call him Mr. Negativity. <laughs> hard to get along. He was always complaining. But he was also the best combat general at a division level of practically any general in the Confederate Army. When the gun started firing, he was in the heat of the action, making the right decisions and risking his life. He also hated Yankees very much. cared much for Virginia. He felt that in the Army of Northern Virginia, there were too many Virginians with a rank of general. He didn't last very long in the Army of Northern Virginia. But today, he was in his helmet, September 17th. He had at least three horses shot from him. One eyewitness said he had five. When he came up to Longstreet, Longstreet, move out of the way, okay? <laughs> You're in the line of fire. You can tell that he'll like George Bergwijn Anderson. Because he put his, reg his four regiments of the Carolina Carolina, he put them in the post of honor. When he had the discretion to line up his entire division, 
put his Carolina Brigade at the far right. And on the early morning of the 17th, they were past, they were down this road, past the tower. And as other elements of Hill's division filled this lane. Now the post of honor is just an 18th or 19th century way of saying, this is the most dangerous place on the battlefield, and you have the responsibility to hold it at all costs until I, or someone superior to me, says you may leave. So that's his, his Carolina troops he considers to be the best in his division. And George Bergwin Anderson is the best brigadier. Now, Hill does get along with one Virginia. It happens to be his brother-in-law. It also happens to be his immediate commander, Stonewall Jackson. They married Carolina girl. Stonewall Jackson's command was posted north. Hill's command was actually in Longstreet's sector of the battlefield. And the battle is a three-act three play. Just like Gettysburg is a three-day battle, I think of Antietam as three day, three, excuse me, three acts. Each act is quite intense, but none match what happened here. The first act begins up on the northern end of the battlefield. Right at dawn, Joseph Hooker's first corps of the Army of the Potomac attacks through the cornfield. McClellan has over has 75,000 men here. Lee, at no time during that day, probably has more than 35,000. The battle goes on four hours, crisscrossing the cornfield and fields that are north of the visitor center. Over 50,000 men are involved in that sector of the battlefield. The Union forces push the Confederates back, but they don't break the line. Two Yankee Corps are up there, plus a division from another corps, and they've got a stalemate. One of the Union Corps commanders, Will Sumner, decided he wanted to be a division commander that day. He demoted himself. And his first division to come up, Sedgwick's, he decided, we're going to attack those west woods. We're going to wheel south and we're just going to clean those rebels right out of the woods and win the battle. He was ambushed. That meant that Sumner's other two, other two divisions came up to the east woods over there without any orders, without a commander, looking for trouble. They saw a, un a small Union division posted very close to the Dunker Church, and they decided we should go southwest and support the, le the left flank of, of that Union division. And so they turned, they put themselves in line of battle, three brigades, each line two ranks deep, each brigade, approximately 2,000 men, and they started marching in this direction right here without knowing what was here. They had no idea. In the meantime, it was about 8 o'clock or so, with Stonewall Jackson having borrowed 
three of Hill's brigade, all about 3,000 men, he moved up an Alabama brigade under Robert E. Rose. And he posted the Alabamians. Their right flank began right where the, the bloody lane turns to the left and heads, uh, and, and heads more in a westerly direction. And the Carolina Brigade under Anderson, and it's called Anderson's Brigade at this stage. And oh, by the way, there are only three Andersons on the, in the Confederate Army in this battle. Two will come up, obviously, George Berlin Anderson. Richard Heron, and Heron Anderson's name will come up as well. They line up 2nd, North Carolina, 14th, 4th and the 14th, right here, me, and the 30th, down toward the tower. Now, how did, what happened? How did this road become a sunken road? It was, by the time the Civil War it was several decades old, the local farmers used it as a shortcut to bypass Sharpsburg, cut over from the Hagerstown, Hagerstown Pike to the Boonsboro Pike. These are free Marylanders. They're avoiding a toll. <laughs> over the decades, the heavy wagons and the erosion wear down this road so it sinks below the level of the rest of the ground. <clears throat> this is, in all appearances, the best defensive place to be in Lee's entire three-mile line, with one notable exception. And those are the, the bluffs overlooking Burnside's Bridge, which is, again, a little over a mile south. So, 1,200 men, what's that, what's that average in a Confederate regiment? How many men average in a Confederate regiment? From 300. We have four regiments. We have 1,200 North Carolinians lined up from that apex down to the tower. We have 800 Alabamians lined up um, turning to the, uh, to the west and towards the Hagerstown Pike. When Stonewall Jackson finally returns Hill's other three brigades, it's gone from you know, about 3,000 to about 300. And they're at the very end, the far left. It's now about 9.30 in the morning. Things have quieted down in that sector of the battlefield. And we have three brigades, one division from the 2nd Corps of the Army of the Potomac bearing down in this direction. The first wave under Max Weber comes across like a blue wave. It has very good alignment. These are well-drilled troops. But they've been garrison troops. One unit is the 5th Maryland. Up on the Nicodemus Heights is, an army, is a Maryland unit in the Army of Northern Virginia. This is a state with divided loyalties. Their, their brigade is in a wide arc because the center guy the guy carrying the flag for the 5th Maryland, he is a slow, deliberate walker. <laughs> and the other two outside regiments have kind of curled ahead of him. But it's in perfect conformity with this line. And when they crest the ridge, just beyond this lane, there are at a perfect range for the, for the muskets, not rifles, but the muskets that the Carolinians and Alabamians are, in, are uh, equipped. 
these nine regiments raise up and in controlled unison fire one volley after another. And those 2,000 troops, the front lines, went down like rain before a reaper. In a matter of five minutes, 450 Union soldiers were carpeting that ridge from just beyond those trees and curling around to near this point. But they didn't run away. They went to ground. And they started shooting back. That was unusual. The next brigade comes up a few minutes later. They're not quite as well far formed because they're all new regiments. They've been in the service less than a month. They have not fired their guns in anger. When they receive those same volleys, one after the other, because the Confederates here <coughs> were exchanging their muskets. The guy on the front rank would fire, pass his musket back, be loaded, and a new one, fully loaded, would be passed to him. There were two men behind him. They could fire at a very sustained rate of perhaps one shot every 10 seconds per man. And it was very effective. And the same thing happened to the next line of, of Union soldiers. In a matter of minutes, they'd gone down the front ranks. Many of them ran away. These were green troops in their first battle. But a surprising number of them stayed and went to ground with the other troops right behind them. Finally, the 3rd Brigade, the most experienced brigade, came forth under Kimball. They could see what was going on, so they, put the, they set their bayonets, fixed them, and they made a rush. And they got very close to these fence rails. And they exchanged volleys, maybe 30 yards apart. But the fire fire was too much for them. They were driven back, and they went to ground. And then they kept sustaining their fire. Their poor brother soldiers who'd been killed suddenly became earthworks, fortifications. And they would crawl up reverse side of those ridges, get behind a dead soldier, who was also now an arsenal. There's plenty of ammunition now, and they kept firing into this lane, and, and casualties here began to mount. This went on for an over an hour, it's called a firefight. Those other battles that I mentioned. There were firefights also. They're tactical stalemates. It's just men shooting at each other. It doesn't take a lot of command and control to do that. They know what they're supposed to do. Fortunately, reinforcements arrive. And how those reinforcements are deployed affects the outcome this action. And I'm going to get into that. But first, I want everyone to pretend that you are a member of one of the left flank companies of the 4th North, North Carolina. You're from Rowan or Wayne County. I want you to all come forward. Well, let's all come together. Holly? <laughs> Holly, you know how to pretend? Holly went to rest. Greg. Greg, you know how to pretend? You know how to pretend? Up up there. Tillman, you know how to pretend? Tom, you know how to pretend? We are Confederate soldiers. 
Noon is approaching. We have to take our shoes off. <laughs> well, let's just say that in your present posture, you would all be dead and wounded. But you're not. So you have to pretend that you're up here hugging this embankment. And you're out of ammunition. You've been at it for over two and a half hours. The last, the last uh, unit brigade that had come up was directly in your front. The Irish Brigade from New York. They were also armed with muskets, firing buck and ball. These were the perfect weapons for the type of fight. You didn't need a rifle. Perfect weapon the type of fight that was going on and contributed to the high casualties. <clears throat> now, when I say but, that's a cue. The response is, I'm still alive. First of all, you've got the worst headache you've ever had. For two and a half hours, think of the worst thunder strike that you've ever heard. Where you saw the lightning strike in the backyard and the sound of that thunder. Think of it. Intensify it. And then <coughs> it's never ending. It has been continuous, that level, continuous, for over two hours. You have over 6,000 muskets out there. Their report is in this general direction. There are men out there firing as quickly as they can. You have dozens of cannons, long-range guns, the kind of guns that you saw yesterday. Across the Antietam, they're firing, fortunately, over our head, but they're still creating a lot of noise. You have Southern Bank behind us, dozens of guns firing, trying to reply, but that's a, that's a wasted effort. Confederates don't have any guns that can reach that far. They can't fire too close to here to hit the hit the Union soldiers on the other side because our boys are here. But they're still trying to have an effect on the outcome here. So you've got a big head, a butt. Sword. Your ears. They're ringing. There are other sounds though. Still here. You hear the balls hitting these split rails and shooting splinters. Now, that's been a nasty thing for over two hours. But I'm still, still alive. alive. I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> Also hear something else. Something you've heard before. Something that will stay with you for the rest of your life. You heard it first on Malvern Hill, maybe at Seven Pines. You hear the, the light cries of young men that you've known from al almost your entire life. Remember what we learned yesterday. We're all from the same community. Some of them are crying out for their sweethearts. And you recognize one in particular because you know that girl. She goes to your church. She's pretty. You know from the previous experience that those will be his final, final breath. And who will be the one that delivers that news? Figure that out because she's pretty. Sooner or later, she'll receive. She'll be receiving.
saving gentlemen again. And you wish you could go for it. But I'm still alive. I'm dead again. <laughs> you also hear voices calling for their mother. Hi, Greg. Same situation. I like the cameras. They're down to their last. Thank day. you. But I'm still, still alive. alive. Why am I? What do you smell? Nothing good. Gunpowder. Gunpowder. Blood. You smell Mississippi. They haven't had a bath in six weeks. <laughs> you haven't had a bath in four weeks. There's a big difference. You notice it. But I'm still, I'm still alive. alive. Now, I'm Lieutenant Frank Weaver, and this whole time, I've been dead. When I was shot, I was a senior officer of the 4th North Carolina, and I was a lieutenant. I was up here. I was waving the flag. <laughs> I wasn't waving the flag defiantly at the Irishman over there. I was waving it at the Mississippi Brigade that had just fired a volley into our backs. I was killed by friendly fire. Mm -hmm. But now I'm hovering above you and I can read your thoughts. How does your mouth and throat feel? You haven't had any water since morning, and there's none left. But I'm still, I'm still alive. alive. How does your shoulder, your right shoulder, feel? And you fired off over 60 rounds. Since about the 20th round, that gun has become fouled. And each shot following gives a stronger kick. Mm -hmm. But now, you're not shooting anymore. You're hugging this ground. But at least, I'm still, still, still alive. alive. Still alive. How does your stomach feel? Empty. Empty. Hungry. Oh, you're very hungry. Mm -hmm. But, I'm still, I'm still alive. alive. I'm still alive. Green corn and green apples does not take care of you very far. And that's what you've been eating for the last two weeks. You look at your feet. They're sticky. Your shoes wore off on the National Pike on the next valley over. Around the 13th, the remnants of your shoe, you've been barefoot since the 13th. When you first noticed the blood on your feet, you thought it might, you might be the one who's been So you took a quick inventory just to make sure you're okay. And then you noticed little streamlets of blood gathering in small pools. But I'm still alive. I'm still alive. <coughs> you look at the sky. You see the sun. Eyes are sore from all the gunpowder and the splinters, but You're still alive. But you have a thought. <clears throat> the battle has been going on for over two hours, or at least it actually seems longer because the sun is no longer moving west. It appears to be going in the reverse direction. And you're coming to a thought that it appears. 
the mutual that the mutual extermination of each side will be the only way this carnage will end. What? Still alive. Still alive. Suddenly you hear a different sound. And you look down the line, and you hear men whooping like Indians. They're Yankees. They're all over there. You see Carolinians from the 30th. Some have begun to raise their arms. Others are riding, running into the cornfield, but they're being shot in the back. All of a sudden, you hear Irishmen yelling like banshees. It's their rebel yell. They're coming forward. For the last two and a half hours, this, the safest place to have been has been right here. The only thing more dangerous would have been leaving this lane. You haven't heard your voices, the voices of any of your officers for, for quite a while, since I've been shot and killed. No orders, no assurances. You've got these wild and crazy Mississippians, except they didn't call them They were out of control. You've got to make a decision, because you just heard an officer with a Mississippi accent say, time to leave, boys. You've got to decide, are you going to stay here with your bayonet and risk being killed? To be captured, it might not be so bad. You hear that 13 Yankees have just surrendered down in Harper's Ferry. That ought to mean a quick exchange. Or do I run through the cornfield? That's the decision you have to make. You're no longer pretending. Everyone still alive? Barely. 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 Back from Hill's headquarters following a request for reinforcement. I'm going to let Elizabeth handle that part of Hill's journey. Excuse me, part of George Wayne Anderson's journey. But how could such a strong position such as this begin to hurt? It looked like the best defensive position on the entire battle. Well, it was an accumulation of factors. First, the Union forces have been able to bring almost 10,000 men to this section. And they have finally achieved sufficient ratio that a final assault has very likely a chance of, of succeeding. I mentioned the reinforcements earlier. Union reinforcements under a division commander named Israel Richardson. His cannon is down there. He was also murdered, but not until he captured this land. He had some enterprising officers, and they were able to extend the Union line beyond the right flank, beyond the right flank of the 30th North Carolina. There were no other Confederates. There could have been, could have been other Confederates, but they were not properly deployed. Their commander, Richard Heron, was wounded in that same orchard before he could come up and get his division organized. And so each brigade on their own initiative somehow tried to find a way to get here. They were commanded by 
the new commander of that division is a guy named Roger Pryor. How many people have heard of Roger Pryor? <laughs> ah, it's, not, it's not in there, is it? <laughs> well, let's just say he helped start the war. He was a lawyer, UVA law, a successionist, a firebrand. He was so impatient with Virginia to succeed, that he went down to Charleston and said, you guys have to start a war, and then Virginia will succeed. And they believed it. And they said, we'll let you fire the first gun, Roger. But that wouldn't be appropriate. Another Virginian took it up, allegedly. This is conjecture, a guy named Edmund Ruffin. Let's just say, though, to keep things on course, that Roger Pryor was not a soldier. In less than a year, he would be a private. And so, his forces failed to reinforce that right flank. And the Mississippians came in, and because of the gunpowder, they thought there were Yankees right here by that friendly fire. Right that didn't help. Finally, all, with all the officers down, there was no more command and control. So when things started to unravel, there really wasn't much to, to decide. You either stayed and were killed and captured, or you tried to run away. Out of the 3,000 Confederates who fought in this lane in its vicinity, 2,500 were captured. Out of the 10,000 Union soldiers, almost 3,000 were captured. So this was indeed a bloody land. Now the men who, who successfully got away or were later exchanged and rejoined their regiments, what would you think would become of those men and those regiments after suffering this kind of horrific experience and these high casualties, you would think they would be broken units that would have to be consolidated with other, with other units. That wasn't how things were done. These regiments were built back up. It's amazing how resilient they were. All of them, Union and Confederate. And the men who fought here would come under the command of a Virginian Robert E. Rhodes, the Al command commanda commanding the Alabamians over there to the left, and a BMI guy, he would take command of this division that had the North Carolina and Alabama brigade, and they would go on with a remarkable record. They would be the frontline troops in Jackson's famous surprise flank attack at Chancellorsville. Many of them would go all the way to Appomattox. At the time Robert Rhodes was killed, almost two years to the day later at Winchester, 3rd Winchester, which is about 35 miles southwest of here, he was considered one of the best division commanders in the Army of Northern Virginia. his division was considered to be militarily the most efficient in the entire army. Who were the cream of that division? The division that was considered to be the best in the Army of Northern Virginia? The Army of Northern Virginia, the best army that the Confederate put out. The army that the entire Confederacy relied upon to win the war. And arguably, man for man, the Army of Northern Virginia is the best army in American history as far as its fighting effort. Who were the cream of Rhodes' division? 
The North Carolinians and the Alabamians fought and survived here. Bloody Lane. And who was the man when these soldiers were were new volunteers and conscripts? Who was the man that inspired them by his skillful leadership and bravery under fire? The man was George Bernanos, who we're here to honor today. So before I turn it over to Elizabeth for the next part of the ceremony, let me invite any questions. Now, was this bench here as well as that bench? Yes. So uh, as they retreated, they had to actually <coughs> expose themselves as they climbed over the fence. Actually, they had moved most of these fence rails over there. Oh, to fill okay. the gaps. Okay. And the gaps that these fence rails couldn't fill, they put the bodies of their former comrades yeah. to fill the gaps. And the cornfield was closer here. So, Much closer. Uh, were the um, artillery uh, hitting in that cornfield? Yes. The Union artillery was was hitting the cornfield. So at the end of the battle. The uh, Union troops were firing into the person who had, who had come up to the lane. And who's ever heard of a corn stalk stopping a musket ball or a mini ball? So it, was, it was dreadful. It was, it was worse leaving here than, than fighting here. Yeah. You're right. Some did on the other side of the orchard in the vicinity of the Hagerstown Pike. Several, <coughs> some among several hundred other Confederates, found in basements and sheds and barns in Sharpsburg. In the evening, they were gathered up. George mentioned in the early morning, General Bull Sumner, <coughs> and with Edwin Sumner, Union General, an older man, came up against the Confederates. Edwin Sumner, memory serves me right, was from Boston. He would have surely recognized the name of that young Confederate over there, whose name was William Heisler Sumner for Whit. William Heisler Sumner and Edwin Sumner were related. Yes. Were Rose Alabamians the same Alabamians that hit Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain on day two of Gettysburg? Different yeah. Alabamians? Yes. Those were Oats. Oats, Rose. Mm -hmm. uh, different, different cores. This is the. Uh, Second Corps, what becomes the Second Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia. And those were commanded by uh, generals in, in the First Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia. They attacked the uh, Little Ant. Yes, Steve. George, where does the general uh, receive this wound? The Ranger told us in the northeastern corner of that apple orchard. Well, he was quite far away. I mean, he wasn't trying to run away. He was returning to this site after the fighting had already 
commence. And uh, appealing to, to Hill to, to bring in um, more troops because he, he anticipated the, the, uh, the risk here, that this was not a perfect defensive position. It had flaws. Um, it had a right flank that was, un, that was unsupported. It had ridges all around it that exceeded it in, in its height and the Union troops could fire into, in a, in a flanking, inflating way, most of this road. They had formed an arc that paralleled this, this road, and they were firing into the road once they'd gone to ground. Collie ready? Collie ready. Well, thanks for your, your patience. Um, I too would like to refer to Robert Crick's wonderful essay entitled, It Appeared as Though Mutual Extermination Would Put a Stop to the Awful Carnage. It's an article or an essay found in Gary Gallagher's book, The Antietam Campaign, and it was referred uh, to me by both George and by Tillman and by John, all of whom said you have to read this to understand what happened here. And it is absolutely true. In his essay, Crick writes that on September 17, 1862, General George Berguin Anderson was wounded and suffered a smashed ankle as he off oversaw his brigade's fight in the Bloody Lane, where we're standing today. The wound caused a tremendous amount of pain, but it did not appear to be serious. It was in the ankle. He was alive. The examining surgeon concluded that a fragment of the shell had hit the foot and glanced off. Only later did his own personal physician discover the mini ball that was embedded and buried deep into the wound. Margie Boatlier, a Shepherdstown woman who cared for several of the brigade's officers wrote to General Anderson's wife, Mildred, on September 18th. And he says, or she says she is writing from the bedside of your husband. And she reassuringly describes the wound as in the foot, not seriously. She says the general sends word that he means to make his way to you very soon and that he did not attend to be long from his brigade. No one dreamt that the, in, that the general's injury would be fatal. And I want to remember, remind you of something that I said yesterday. When Mildred Ewing um, Anderson was pregnant with their first child, he says, I will never, never be away from you when you ever have a child again. And so he has promised her that he will get home. Now he's injured, and Mildred is about to have her second child. He needs to go home to recuperate. He doesn't think he's seriously wounded, but he's made a promise. In addition, his eldest child, little baby Ewing, is again desperately sick. Ewing was always sick and lived a very short and very uh, difficult life. His health was very fragile. And so, again, no one dreamt that the general's injury might be fatal. Immediately following his injury, the general was carried to Piper House, where Dr. L. A. Stitt treated the wound. Artillery rounds and small arms fire hit the house and hit the grounds, which were, quote, torn, all, all, torn and shot all to pieces. One shell knocked off half of the kitchen and turned over a pot full of chicken stew. <coughs> so not only is he injured, not only is he anxious and desperate about his men in a vulnerable position, not only is he anxious about his 
wife and his children. But he's also being shelled while he's being cared for. Later, after the Bloody Lane collapsed, Northern soldiers advanced within a few yards of that house. And the general told his attendants that he would prefer being shot through the head to being captured. So his aides, Seton Gales and Walter Battle and two ambulance corps men carried him across the fields to the Boltlier house. Seton Gales and Walter Battle thought it would be utterly impossible for a man to walk 10 steps without being killed. But they all escaped death and they carried their general across the fields to safety. After a day and a half at the Boatlier House, Anderson faced the exhausting ordeal and the harrowing ordeal of a wagon trip all the way to Staunton. And George has already pointed out that's in that direction. And from there, he traveled by train all the way to Raleigh. His brother, Staff Officer Robert Walker Anderson, who had been wounded in the shoulder, accompanied the, the general. Uh, there are different accounts, and many, many people believe that he served as aide-de-camp to the general, and, um, and yet nobody's 100% certain. But he was with his brother and um, would later go on to be killed at the wilderness. You'll remember Anderson was determined to reach his wife and family in Raleigh, and he eventually reached home on September 26th. Now remember, he was injured on the 17th. It takes until the 26th to get home. And in the meantime, the mini ball in his ankle is festering. Mildred was expecting their second child, who would be born on October 18th, two days after his father's death. In addition, young Ewing Anderson was only a year old, and as I said, his health had always been a serious concern to his parents, was ill again, terribly ill again. Young Ewing would pass away on November 2nd, 1862, just 17 days after his father's death. And today, for some of you whom I've talked to, you will realize that I am wearing Mildred's locket. And this is the first time it's been found in a long, long time. Only when the general arrived in Raleigh did his private physician discover the ball buried deep in the wounded joint. Infection and amputation followed, and the general died on the morning of October 16, 1862. There is a wonderful obituary that was found in the trunk from the Raleigh Register, and it is dated Wednesday morning, October 22nd, 1863, and it is entitled the funeral of the late George Bergwin Anderson. It reads, and I'm quoting, the funeral of this lamented and distinguished officer took place on Saturday in conformity with the published order of proceedings, with the exception that the clergyman officiating was Reverend Samuel Iridell Johnston of the, of the Episcopal Church. Instead, of the Reverend Joseph M. Atkins of the Presbyterian. <laughs> this change was made on account of the unexpected arrival of Dr. Johnston, who was a very near and dear connection to, this, to the deceased. The procession was a very large one, the 31st Regiment being out in full force and a conscript guard of at least 500 men. Citizens on foot and in carriages swelled the procession until it had extended a distance not short of a half a mile. 
the remains were deposited for the present in the public cemetery of the city, after which the usual three volleys were fired over the grave and the military returned to their quarters and the citizens to their homes. Attached to the saddle on the horse, which was led by the body servant of General Anderson, was the sword which he wore when he received his fatal wound. The sword was once the property of the late Captain John Bergwin, an uncle of the deceased, <coughs> and was attached to his person when he fell gallantly fighting at the Battle of Pueblo de Taos. The tidings of General, Washington, er, General, General Anderson's death will carry sorrow wherever he was known. In the Army especially, they were received with heartfelt grief by the officers and the men, for the deceased possessed the entire and unreserved confidence of the former, while by his gentlemanly yet firm demeanor had won the warm attachment of the latter. <clears throat> Most particularly was this the case in his old regiment, the 4th, the survivors of which will be gratified to learn that the old flag, which waved above them at Williamsburg and at Seven Pines, and riddled with bullets, was borne on its shattered staff in the procession which escorted the remains of the, their old and loved commander to his long home. General George Berguin Anderson is now buried next to his son, Ewing Anderson, in Oakwood Cemetery in Raleigh, North Carolina. And now I would like to ask Polly and Gray to help me. As we lay a wreath, in honor of our kinsman, the General George Bergwin Anderson. Polly, can you help me? Yes. Okay. Come on, guys. You help guide me. Each take a side. Okay. Come on over here, Polly. Okay. 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 Let's go. It's kind of heavy. Let's go this way. And put it right in front of the cannon which is the general's marker. Okay, can you help me push in the spokes just a little bit and in the front so it doesn't tip over? Okay? There we go. There we go. <laughs> now, come here and stand up here with me, Collie, because I know you can do this and I'm betting Gray can do it. <coughs> you remember how to salute? Can you do that for me? Salute? No, you're not going to do it? Okay. It's okay. Great. <coughs> Thank you, one and all. Don't mess with the collar pillow. <coughs> Friends and family, that concludes <coughs> our reunion. I hope you've had as a wonderful and memorable time as, as I have. I hope there'll be another opportunity to get together in the foreseeable future. Any volunteers? <laughs> now this is going to be five years from now. <laughs> there was some talk last night that maybe we would want to go to Raleigh, but there's a, the, the, the door is open to the next reunion location. Taos to Pueblo. There's, there is always that. Having been to Taos to Pueblo, there ain't much there. No? <laughs> the location's great, though. Yeah, the location is great. Well, and the Indian guides will tell you all about how the... The other side. Yeah. The other side. Their side. side of the story. Oh, no, but I don't really think you want to come to Toronto. <laughs> but I'll help.